today is we're going to make ultimately a measurement on a board where we oh, we have access to BGA pads and we want to go out to a connector. The difficulty is that we don't have a ground connection by each of the signal pads in the BGA. So we're going to take advantage of some spark capabilities in forming the differential measurement. So we'll have a ground connection on the far end but we won't have any ground connections on the near end. Since we only have BGA pads, we don't have a connector there, so we're going to end up using a probe on a, a probe range or probe station from front range probe stations. In this case, we're using DVT, solution, uh, DVT Solutions DVT-30 probe, which is a differential probe. does not have any ground connections at the tip, so we're going to configure the spark in differential mode so that we don't need that ground. We're going to come over here and make a differential port 1 on the left side, and we're going to make a differential port 2 on the right side, but for the port 2 side, we're going to use connectors. In order to be able to de-embed the probe out of the measurement, we don't want the probe to take place in the measurement. We're going to have the spark de-embed the electrical response from the end of the blue spark cables to the tip of the probe. In order for us to do that, we need to find electrically where the end of the probe is. <clears throat> so I'm going to use the OSLT coupon, which is a calibration and demonstration coupon from CCN, and there's a short structure on the device. We're going to use that, we're going to touch that short, and we're going to find the end of the electrical probe um, using the spark and touching the probe um, to the pad. So the first thing I need to do is drop the, uh, electric, the contact of the probe onto that shorting pad. At the angle that the probe is located, we note that as I drop the probe and it makes contact, it scoots forward a little bit. That's called skating, which helps it dig into the metal and make electrical contact. We're using the microscope to visualize the touchdown, but what I'm really interested in is I really want to see the electrical touchdown. So we're going to use the spark. I've configured the spark at this point to have two ports. Port 1 and port 2 are going to be combined together to form one differential port. So under the setup menu of the Spark, we click on the big setup button. We get here, we get to this window called configure ports. We click on configure and this is the ultimate configuration. Next to the DUT, we have physically port 1 and 2 of the spark. But we want to set this up in differential mode. So we click differential, select differential, and now we have two wires. So we, at the end of the probe, we only have like the plus wire, and we have the minus wire. The plus wire is running to port 1, the minus wire is running to port 2 on the spark, but we don't have any ground. So port is really two wires, so I only have one port legitimately that I can work with. So I select the output to be port 1, and normally I have the option of having a common mode port or a second port. I'm going to X that out because I physically don't have any other ports other than one port because I only have the plus and the minus wires without their ground connections. So this is the configuration. I apply that close the window, make sure that the checkbox says that it's enabled. I've set the in frequency to 40 gigahertz, that gives us the most amount of time resolution. So the delta T's are the smallest if we have the bandwidth open to 40 gigahertz. 2000 points gives us the minimum point spacing of 20 megahertz of, of measurements without in, invoking interpolation. We have this set in normal mode because our devices are rather short. We don't need to go to that extended mode, which takes a little bit more time. And everything else at this point is clicked off. I do want to make sure, though, in instrument setup, that the de-embed cable function is turned on, so all four of the blue cables will be removed from the measurement. Okay, with that setup, I'm going to go to TDRT mode. And we're going to go to live TDRT, 
we get that running by clicking the acquire button. I have the pulsar coming in on port one. I'm going to look at the port one trace and then the signal is going to go over to port two. But port one and port two are both going to the probe. So port one is coming to the probe on the way I'm looking at it, the side closest to me. And port two is going to the other side of the probe. So this is going to be, uh, however you want to think about it, the one is going to be our plus line, the two is going to be our minus line, and these go down to the tips of the probe where there are no where the ground becomes discontinuous. So the live mode is basically right now showing um, the, the the probe on the short circuit pad, and if I lift that up, the display will change. The display at this point, the probe is lifted off of the pad, and it's open circuit. If I think about Eric Bogatin's teaching about always knowing what the answer should be before I do the measurement. This, this is exactly what I would expect. Port 1 shows the signal coming in. This is inside of the spark. Travels through the blue cables. Hits our probe somewhere around that little blip right there. And at the end of the probe it sees totally open circuit. <clears throat> Port 2 not being connected at all, there should be no TDR signal getting through to port 2. If you look closely, you'll see a little segment of like coupling that's taking place in the probe. So this little region where there's a little bit of signal sneaking through is actually the coupling that's inside of the DVT-30 probe. Okay, now I can use the microscope to visualize touchdown, but it's much more um, effective than any probing situation use an electrical measurement to know whether or not I have good touchdown. And this live TDR mode of the spark is key in doing this. As I drop the probe, we'll see the response change once I have good contact. So here, the microscope might be showing that it looks like it's touching, but it hasn't skated forward enough to cut through the metal oxide on the top. And now I've got good connection. I also know I've got good connection by tapping on the probe in the electrical traces aren't dancing around when I do this. Okay, when I shorted that out, it basically connected the tip of port 1 to port 2. Well, that should mean that the impedance is relatively well matched, because going from port 1 down to the tip of the probe, all I'm doing is I'm just connecting those two tips, signal comes back over to port 2, should be fairly well terminated, and sure enough, it, we don't see very big reflections again, except for some coupling inside of the probe. And then the signal now has got to show up on the port two side, and sure enough, when we drop the probe, we see that we get a good signal coming through on port two. Okay, but we're not going to use it as port one and port two. We're not using it as a two port. We're configured it so that this is going to be a differential channel. So I'm actually just going to do a quick measurement. Okay, so it's completed the measurement. Now, again, trying to predict what I would expect, looking at to the probe as a differential signal now, so assuming that there's a differential signal incident to the probe, and considering this a differential port, what is a differential signal going to see? Well, it's going to see some discontinuity as it makes the connection to the probe. The signal is going to transverse the probe, and we'll see some bizarre effect. And then at the end of the probe, we have a differential short. So the impedance at the end of the tip, differentially, should go to zero ohms. And if I look at the blue trace, which is the measurement result, as impedance is a function of time, so it's S11, which is the reflection coefficient, but displayed as impedance, 
we end up seeing that we start with an impedance that's about 100 ohms differentially. I'm going to put the cursors on the time domain trace that I want. So we start right here at the end of the blue cables. The blue is our measurement, the blue trace is our measurement. And if I look at the measurement of impedance of S11, I'm measuring about 110 ohms. So it's a little bit high going into those SMA connectors on the probe, but nominally about 100 ohms. The signal is going to see the impedance of um, the SMA connectors, the transition, and then it's going to get into the body of the probe. That's this flat plateau hut here is going to be the body. And then down at the end, we're going to have the tips. And at the tip of the probe, it should go to a short circuit. So the goal here is to find where is the end of the probe. I move the cursor out here to the point where the short circuit first starts showing up. It's a little bit of a uh, user's choice because there's a couple points I could use there. I'm going to use the one that I think is really where the short first starts um, turning on, or we first start seeing it, and that point is at 458 picoseconds, meaning that I need to tell the spark in order to de-embed it that I want to de-embed this section of the electrical response everywhere from zero to time equals 458 picoseconds. In order to, you need to take a break, or should I keep going? Okay. In order to do that, I'm going to go to gating. Gating is an option to basically electrically remove the S parameter response of that probe or any interconnection whatsoever. So I need to set, I need to first tell the probe that in fact I want to, I want to, I mean I have to tell the spark that I want to de embed 458 picoseconds of electrical length. I'm not going to put any loss in because I don't know that yet, but we'll figure that out once we start looking at the S parameters. Okay, so I want to de-embed 458 picoseconds. I enable that. I don't have to do another measurement. I'm just going to recalculate. The Spark software is going to apply its correction algorithm, which is known as peeling, which builds the S parameters of that 458 picosecond length that I just told it about. At that point, all we see is the short circuit transition. Okay, if I look at that instead of in Z mode, right now I was looking at S11 differential Z. I'm going to now switch that over so that we can look at it as the magnitude of the reflection coefficient in log form, in dB form. Click on that. I have to go do reset zoom. And this is S11 as a function of frequency now. As we would expect, S11 and dB of a good reflection is zero, and so it stays zero. I need to make my cursors into the frequency domain. I do that by going to cursor setup. Down here under x-axis, instead of seconds, I need to select the unit of hertz, and that will put my cursor into the frequency domain. And so now I can go out to some point and look at what the S11 value is. And if I put the marker at about 11 gigahertz, it says the loss is about 0.42 dB. So a perfect short would have zero loss. So we're going to assume that that loss is in the cable. And the last part of the gating is to go back to the setup, go to gating, and we're actually going to dial in a little bit of loss. I'm going to start at 10 millidB. This is actually 10 millidB per one nanosecond of cable at one gigahertz. So it assumes it's a slope delay per frequency for a one, megahertz, one nanosecond equivalent length. And we'll recalculate that. And the loss gets a little bit better. It's still 0.32. So I'm going to go to 40 millidB. 
And again, I'm, this is information I'm giving uh, Teledyne LaCroix's algorithm for de-embedding so that it does a better job of building the S parameters of the probe. And at that point, the loss at 11 gigahertz shows minus 20 millidB. That's certainly within the noise. And so that's, that is the settings that I'm going to use for this probe for the device under test measurement. So that whole process was just to be able to come up with the S parameters of that probe. The Spark calculated them for us, and we did it just by finding the electrical end of the probe, telling it that we wanted to de-embed 458 picoseconds. Then we went back and said, well, I don't know what the loss is, but I'm going to use the short circuit to tell me what the loss is, because I know that it should be 0 dB, and then I just added loss value for the probe up until the point where we got that to be pretty much zero at the upper frequency that I'm interested in looking at. <clears throat> With that, we can now go over to the device under test and um, start the measurements of, of the de starting from the BGA pads.